Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. Potholder has just released a video in response to my previous video, which debunked his Ice Age claims. My original video included long clips of Potholder, and his response included long clips of me. Obviously, we can't keep doing that, so I've condensed this video down to just very small, relevant segments. I'm going to show how his response relied on appeals to authority and generally avoided any discussion of actual science. So let's start with some real science. Let's talk about the causes of Ice Age cycles. Milinkovic was a Serbian astronomer who early in the last century came up with a very plausible theory for the causes of Ice Age cycles. Let's go over the basics of that now. In this discussion, I'm going to focus on the Northern Hemisphere, because that's where most of the Earth's land is located, and that's really where ice ages occur. The Southern Hemisphere is dominated by oceans, and ocean temperatures don't change that much, so they're buffered away from the worst impacts of ice ages. This image shows what Earth's orbit looks like now. Note that Earth's orbit is elliptical, not circular. It's currently winter in the Northern Hemisphere, and looking at this diagram, we can see why. The Earth has a 23 degree tilt to its axis, and the northern hemisphere is currently tilted away from the Sun. Most of the Earth's sunlight is currently going to the southern hemisphere, and a smaller amount is going to the northern hemisphere. This deficiency in the northern hemisphere is what's causing the cold temperatures in winter. It may seem counterintuitive to people in the northern hemisphere, but Earth is also at its closest point to the Sun, which we reached on January 3rd. So it's not our distance from the sun which causes winter, it's the tilt of the earth. But distance from the sun is very important for determining climate. Because earth's orbit is elliptical, in the current configuration we get a short, mild winter and a long, mild summer. Let me explain. Because earth is closest to the sun in January, we get a relatively mild winter with a relatively large amount of sunlight. If January had occurred over here at the furthest distance from the Sun, we would have a very cold winter. Also note that because of Earth's elliptical orbit, we get a short winter and a long summer. If the Earth was over here during January, we would get a very long winter and a short summer. And that's exactly what happens during ice ages. If the Earth was over here during January, there would be minimal sunlight and we'd be having a very long winter. This would cause ice to start accumulating at around 65 degrees north. Ice is white and it reflects sunlight away from the Earth. So we start getting ice accumulating. The ice is reflecting sunlight away from the Earth. And then during the short summer, we don't have enough time to melt all the ice. This keeps going on year after year. More ice, less sunlight, short summer, ice doesn't have time to melt. The ice edge keeps expanding towards the equator. During the last ice age, the ice came all the way down to Kentucky, and Chicago and New York were more than a mile deep under ice. Milinkovic calculated that the 65 degree latitude was critically important for this, and that variations in sunlight at that latitude are about 25% between glacial cycles and interglacial cycles. I'm going to repeat these numbers now. Milinkovic calculated that at 65 degrees north, which is a critical latitude, we get a 25% variation in sunlight between glacial cycles and interglacial cycles. I want you to remember these numbers because in a minute I'm going to show you how a potholer tries to deceive you. But first, let's look at some nice images from Indiana University describing the Milinkovic cycles. One factor is the elliptical nature of Earth's orbit. Sometimes it's more circular, sometimes it's more elliptical, and this is very important. Another factor is the axial tilt. This is also very important. Remember that winter wouldn't occur if we didn't have a tilt to the Earth's axis. The axial tilt varies between 24.5 degrees and 21.5 degrees. It's currently about 23 degrees. The greater the tilt, the more severe winters are going to be. The third part of Milinkovic cycles is precession. Earth actually wobbles like a top. This is what causes the change in seasons over time. Currently, Earth is close to the Sun during the Northern Hemisphere winter. But in 10,000 years, Earth will be furthest from the Sun during the Northern Hemisphere winter. So once again, right now, Earth has short, mild winters and long, mild summers. 
but in 10,000 years, it'll be the opposite. We'll have short, hot summers and long, cold winters. This next quote from the Indiana University webpage is very important. Let's read it. It's of primary importance to explain that climate change and subsequent periods of glaciation resulting from the following three variables is not due to the total amount of solar energy reaching Earth. The three Milinkovic cycles impact the seasonality and location of solar energy around the Earth, thus impacting contrasts between the seasons. Let me repeat this again and note that the bold letters here are Indiana University's bold letters, not mine. Ice ages are not due to the total amount of solar energy reaching the Earth. It's variations in the seasonality and location of the solar energy which causes the ice ages. Now let's listen to Potholer's appeal to authority and see how he tries to deceive you about the causes of ice ages. I'll go through his claims in chronological order. Here's the first one. I cite and show the study they came from. This is from my video, Does CO2 Lead or Lag Global Warming? A paper by Laureus et al. shows that insulation has varied by only 0.7 watts per square meter over the last 160,000 years. In other words, the tiny amount of forcing due to the Earth's orbit wasn't enough to defrost miles of thick ice covering a large part of the planet. Researchers have calculated that they aren't large. And again, it's not my theory. Professional researchers know very precisely what these orbital variations are, and they can calculate within given margins of error how much they affect the energy budget of the Earth. Of course, Tony can speculate that it's much bigger or much smaller. He's free to imagine any figures he likes. But researchers can't do that. They have to go with what the measurements and calculations show. And as a science reporter, I can't do that either. I have to accurately report their results. So I'm sure you heard his appeal to authority about how he's quoting professional researchers. Let's look closely at his claim from the professional paper he's citing. The total insulation received by Earth has varied by less than 0.7 watts per meter. But this is junk science. As I just pointed out from the Indiana University website, total solar insulation is irrelevant. Remember what Indiana University said, the ice ages are not due to the total amounts of solar energy reaching the Earth. It's unfortunate that the researchers in Potholer's professional paper didn't seem to actually understand the science behind what they were discussing. And remember what Malinkovich said, the key latitude is 65 degrees north. He said there's 25% variations between ice ages and interglacials. 25% variation is about 100 watts per meter squared. Not the irrelevant 0.7 watts per meter squared, which Potholer is citing. The number Potholer is citing in his professional paper, 0.7 watts per meter, is off by a factor of more than 100 from the relevant number which Milinkovic was using. Total solar insulation was never a part of Milinkovic's theories, and the Indiana University webpage made it very clear that it's irrelevant. Potholer used a straw man argument citing an appeal to an authority from an irrelevant paper. He used many other deceptions during that segment of the video, but I'm not going to waste time on those and just stick with the really important ones. Now let's listen to the segment about Al Gore. I've made no indication in any of my videos that I'm not concerned about children being misinformed about science, whether it's by Al Gore or Laurie David or anyone else. I've frequently spoken out in my videos about the need to stop junk science creeping into classrooms. In my first video, I showed Potholer criticizing Al Gore. My criticism of Potholer was centered around the fact that he just blew off Al Gore as being someone irrelevant. Al Gore is hardly someone irrelevant. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for his junk science. There was no outcry from the science community or from journalists like Potholer at the time. Ten years ago is when they should have been criticizing Al Gore, when he was getting the Nobel Prize. The science community and journalists like Pothole were perfectly happy at the time to let Al Gore's junk science slide because it brought in money to their community. Now let's look at another appeal to authority by Potholer. 
What I said was that CO2 followed temperatures in the early stages of deglaciation in the southern hemisphere, because I'm reporting the conclusion of scientific studies. In the latter stages of deglaciation shown on the graph, and in the northern hemisphere, CO2 led temperature rise. So just as it's wrong for Al Gore to give the impression that CO2 always leads temperature changes, it's wrong for Tony to give the impression that CO2 always lags. If Tony's concerned that billions of schoolchildren are being lied to about this topic, and I don't doubt his sincerity, then I hope he'll join me in insisting that schoolchildren should be told what the science says. Puddle is describing a single very controversial paper by Shakun as if that represented the opinion of the scientific community. Many scientists have poked holes in Shakun's work, and it's pretty much irrelevant to the discussion anyway. Shakun is almost certainly wrong, but the real issue is climate sensitivity. You just can't get that large a swing in temperatures as occurs during ice ages from the change in carbon dioxide concentration. It's not even close. This leads into the next segment where he makes his one valid, though irrelevant, criticism. So I didn't say that a 10 degree rise in temperature came from a 100 part per million rise in CO2. And certainly no study I've ever read has made such a claim or given that interpretation to the data used to make the graph. Tony Heller assumed that that's what the graph shows because he made a basic error when he tried to interpret the graph for himself. To find out what he got wrong, we first need to find out where he got this graph from. Tony doesn't tell us because he doesn't give his sources, so I had to track it down myself. It's been passed around the internet a lot, but by searching the image and screening the time it was first uploaded, I finally found the first posting of it from a slideshow, and that led me to this slide presentation at Harvard. The data for the graph, according to the authors, came from this paper by Petit et al. This is the graph he was referring to. It's not really very hard to find this graph. It's the first thing that comes up when you type in Antarctic ice core graphs. He tries to make it sound like I'm hiding something. But this is just the standard data from the ice cores, and I just assumed that he knew how to use Google. Anyway, his valid criticism was that I used a 10C change in temperature for 100 parts per million change in CO2. And his point was, yes, it was 10C change in Antarctica, but that wasn't the change in global temperature. I'll accept his criticism, but it's largely irrelevant. This graph is from the 1990 IPCC report, and it shows about a 5C swing in temperature between ice ages and interglacials. That's about half of what the Antarctic ice cores show. Using even the highest estimates of climate sensitivity from the IPCC report, you can only account for about 1C swing in temperature from the 100 parts per million change in carbon dioxide. So the vast majority of the change can't be due to carbon dioxide. It has to be due to something else. Just as Milinkovic explained, the ice ages are caused by the 25% variation in insulation at 65 degrees north and the subsequent increase in ice, which causes an increase in reflectivity of the Earth and a subsequent decrease in the amount of sunlight which is being absorbed by the Earth. Then he goes off into an utterly ridiculous discussion about this graph. Let's listen to it. But as any scientist will tell you, just because something is small in quantity doesn't mean it has a correspondingly small effect. If you don't agree, try ingesting just 0.06% of your body weight in strychnine and see what effect that has. He's tried to make the claim that tiny amounts of methane in the Earth's atmosphere, less than two parts per million, have a big impact on Earth's radiative budget. But it simply isn't true. As I explained in the last video, I've done software development work for the National Center for Atmospheric Research on their radiative transfer models. I know quite a bit about it. The contribution of methane is so small that many times modelers don't even bother to consider it, and you can see why in this graph. I'm going to explain this again very simply, and hopefully this time even potholer will be able to understand. Methane only has three small, narrow spectral spikes, and only two of any significance. And both of these small, narrow spectral spikes of methane overlap with the very tall, broad spectrum of water vapor. Water vapor is a much more potent greenhouse gas than nearly irrelevant methane. 
If the atmosphere has any significant amount of water vapor, which it almost always does, the tiny little specter of methane is already saturated. So methane becomes irrelevant, and that's why modelers often ignore it. I don't want to waste any more time showing you Potholder's video. You can watch it yourself if you want. But he goes on again and makes another ridiculous claim that methane can build up to large quantities in the atmosphere. It can't. The Earth has spewed out huge amounts of methane over the last few billion years, but we have less than two parts per million in the atmosphere. And the reason is because we have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. So the methane quickly oxidizes to carbon dioxide and water. You can never build up a large amount of methane in an atmosphere which contains significant amounts of oxygen. And even if you could increase the amount of methane in the atmosphere by a factor of 10, radiative transfer models show that that would have a very small impact on the amount of downwelling long wave radiation. And that, once again, is because the methane spikes overlap with the water vapor spectra. If there's a significant amount of water vapor in the atmosphere, the methane spectral bands are already nearly saturated. So adding more methane does very little. I understand that you can find a lot of stuff out there on the internet saying that methane is a hugely potent greenhouse gas, but you can see from this diagram that it simply isn't true. The only two greenhouse gases of any significance in Earth's atmosphere are water vapor and carbon dioxide. The others are very small components. Like I said, I don't want to spend any more time showing you Potholder's video. You can watch it yourself if you want. But he goes on to another segment where he shows that he doesn't understand about feedbacks. He conflates the discussion about a gain of less than one with a gain of more than one. If carbon dioxide feedback produced a gain of more than one, it would become the driver of climate. It would go out of control and you would never be able to get out of an ice age. Or when you started out of an ice age, you'd never be able to stop and you'd end up like Venus. Potholder is not a scientist, but he loves appeals to authority and he's easily fooled by junk science. Potholder originally agreed to do a live real-time debate and I think that would be a much better solution than doing these back and forth videos which are very time consuming both for me and for you. Then I could immediately point out his appeals to authority and his junk science as he states it. There just isn't enough time in this video to cover all the appeals to authority, junk science, condescension, and ridiculous claims which Potholder is making. Hopefully we'll do that. In the meantime, visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science for a long time.